Okay, this is the three one notes for calculus one. Before we get into the gist of this section, we're gonna let's do a mini review of section two one, which was the first section we covered in the course. Uh, we, we concentrated a lot on velocities. If you recall, we talked about the trip down the parkway and all that good stuff. Well, uh, we talked about two different velocities. We talked about first the average velocity. Now recall that the average velocity was essentially the slope of the secant line. So if you recall, the formula looks something like this, fx minus fa over x minus a. And how did we do it? Well, we started with, let's say, two points, let's say PQ. We drew a line through those points, and essentially by finding that slope of that line, that was the average velocity over the span P to Q. But there was another velocity that was of importance to us. It was called the instantaneous velocity. Now, the instantaneous velocity we could not find directly. Instead, we needed to use a more indirect approach. So what did we do? Well, uh, if you look over basically onto the graph, what we did was we found P and then we took the slope of a line to a shorter time span, then another shorter time span. And we created all the average velocities for shorter and shorter time spans. So eventually though, we realized that these numbers were approaching in number 64, and we called that our instantaneous velocity. So what does it have to do with? Well, first, as we, what happened eventually is as we created smaller and smaller time spans, we eventually ended up with one line going through the point P, which it was a tangent line. So the instantaneous velocity is essentially just the slope of the tangent. Now, in formula speak, if we took the formula here, and put, which is right here, and took the limit as x approaches a, we would end up with the, tan the slope of the tangent, which is essentially this table. Okay, so once we get that information, we move on to the new concept, and it's exactly this. The, we call now the slope of the tangent line the derivative of the function. So even though we knew that the slope of the tangent line before was this instantaneous velocity or rate of change generally, uh, now we're going to have a new term for the slope of the tangent line, which is called the derivative. And we represent the derivative as f prime or in function world f prime of x. If we're actually writing it out, just like the function f would be f of x. So uh, this is essentially where we're at. Uh, the deri so the definition of a derivative is very formal here. Uh, basically, uh, you'll see that f prime of x is defined as follows. The limit of h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Uh, any function that is, can, you can find a derivative for is called differentiable. We'll get more to that term in the next section when we talk about how to determine differentiability. But for now, this is the formula we use. Now, just to be clear though, uh, if you look up here, uh, the slope of the tangent is the derivative. Okay, so this is basically equivalent, right? It's the slope of the tangent is the derivative. So uh, notice we have two, two different formulas. So real quick, just look up here and down here. These are two formulas for the same thing. So hypothetically, we could use either, but in the, in the wild or in practice, we use this formula much more often. So even though we spent a lot of time deriving the formula using all these steps and getting to here, this is just a different variation of this. Literally, they mean the same thing in terms of Math, if we did computations, there would be no difference. So for the purpose of what we're doing, we're going to concentrate on this. It's called the difference quotient, the right side of this. So we're basically going to use that formula, just to be clear. Uh, also, a small side note of something. Let's say that your equation was in the form y equals 3x minus 2. Uh, if we were to use, so in, when it's f of x, we use f prime of x. But what do we do when it's y? Instead, we use the, ter the terminology dy dx is equal to, this would end up being 3. You don't know how to do that yet, but I'll just, uh, that would be the terminology for the derivative. And what does it mean 
dy dx, it's the derivative of y with respect to x. Okay, so just to summarize at the top of the page, okay, it says to be clear, f prime of x is equal to the limit of h goes to zero of this difference quotient, f, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. This is referred to as the derivative of the function. What does that mean? That means that it represents the slope of the tangent at any point on the curve. I'm going to reiterate that many times in the lesson, but that's what the derivative represents. If you're looking for the slope of the tangent at any specific point on the curve, uh, let's say the point is a f of a, then we must find f prime of a. I will get into that part later. You need to concentrate on the first sentence I'm there and understanding exactly what that means and the importance of it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the rock problem. Now, the rock problem, if you recall, had this function to represent its height at any certain time where x was time. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this information to f go through and find all the important uh, parts of the problem, specifically slope of the tangent and all that good stuff in order to represent uh, what we need from the problem. Okay, so let's key on what they're asking for. It says, first, let's find the slope of the tangent line to the curve at any point. Realize that this is called the derivative. All right, so we know what f of x is. It's right here, right, f of x. So we need to find f prime of x. f prime of x is defined as the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. All right, so just a note here. Uh, we already know what f of x is. It's right here, which means that is going to end up going right there. But what does f of x plus h mean? Well, remember, whenever I gave you some terminology like f of 2, what did you do with 2? You plugged it in wherever you saw x. Well, now it's f of x plus h. So I need to plug in x plus h wherever I see x in the function. So what does that look like? Well, we got the limit of h goes to 0. We'll start with the numerator here. We got uh, plug x plus h into the function, get negative 16 times x plus h squared plus 96. Plug in x plus h for x, x plus h. Then we need to subtract uh, the actual function itself, which is right here. Okay, we need to subtract that. So what are we going to get? We're going to get, uh, actually, uh, minus 16x squared plus 96x, and then all over h. Okay, so just to reiterate, uh, if we, we have everything in, clearly in the numerator, we're just going to have to simplify a lot, which is our point, but just to be clear, if we, again, try to evaluate this limit by plugging 0 in here, we would have division by 0, and we could not evaluate the limit as is. So hopefully everybody remembers the strategy here. What always happens in these problems? We always end up eliminating h using something in the numerator. So remember, that is the strategy with this. Knowing that is very helpful before you even start the problem because you're going to be looking out for that. Okay, so uh, let's talk about, uh, first of all, here. So this guy here. See this? So x plus h squared. Let's do a little side work over here just to make life a little easier for us. So x plus h squared is uh, absolutely not equal to x squared plus h squared. Okay, so that is a large error mistake. Make sure you don't do that. Remember, this actually is equal to x plus h times x plus h, which means we have to FOIL and get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Okay, so essentially what we're doing is we're taking this and replacing uh, that quantity. Oops, uh, we're replacing that quantity with this. Okay, so that's what's going in right so if we do that, we can save some work here. We're going to be using the distributive property in order to do this. So if we distribute negative 16 to each one of these, we're going to get negative 16 x squared minus 32xh minus 16h squared. Then if we go to here, 
we're going to get 96x plus 96h. And then we move to the other part where we need to distribute this negative and get plus 16x squared minus 96x. And that is all over h. Continuing on, uh, one of the things that you'll notice uh, when using the formula is very nice things occur in the numerator. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at this negative 16x squared right here, and then there's a positive version of it over the right, you can clearly see that these are going to cancel out. If you look for any xh terms in the next term, there are none. If you look at 16, negative 16h squared, it looks like there are none. But when you go to 96x, there is a canceled out term, none for 96h. So what's always going to happen? You're always going to end up canceling out all terms that don't have an h in it. So if we rewrite all these, which are not like terms as such, we have a very great situation happening. Why? Because each one of these terms has an H in it. So there's a lot of ways you can do this. You can just cancel them out as is. Technically, the proper algebraic technique is to factor out an H and get nine, negative 32X minus 16H plus 96 all over H and then cross them out. But you can hypothetically, for sure, just cancel them out the way they are. So what is that going to look like? You're going to get the limit of h goes to 0. The fraction is gone, as is the h, and you end up with this term. That was the point of the entire process, because now what are you looking at? You're basically looking at uh, a quantity that has one h in it, which means we can now use this limit, so we drop it, and we get negative 32x minus 16 times 0 plus 96, which is equal to negative 32x plus 96. So in the end, what is the result? I'm going to rewrite it over here. The derivative of the function is officially negative 32x plus 96, but how would you rewrite? You don't have to rewrite it, but how would you rewrite it? It would look like this, basically. f prime of x is equal to negative 32x plus 96. So I just want to be super clear. So this represents the slope of the tangent line at any point on the curve. So wherever the curve is, if I draw a point and then draw a tangent line, this will provide the slope of that tangent line for me by just subbing in that value of x. Okay, so moving on. Let's get into the finer details of what this means, uh, this finding that we have over here. So we have the derivative, which we know is the slope of the tangent line at any point. But what if we want to find the slope of the tangent line at a specific point? Let's say 180, okay, 1 comma 80. So how do we determine that? Well, I set up here, if we want to find, let me get rid of some of this. So if we want to find the slope of the tangent line at a specific point, let's say 180, we must find f prime of 1. So if a was 1, that's what it is. So we look down here and we go, oh, okay. So if we need to find f prime of 1, then look over here real quick. Well, what is, what, if we want to find f of 1, we would plug it into the original function, x equals 1, right? But what would we do here? We do the same thing, except you plug 1 into the derivative of the function and get 64 feet per second as the slope of the tangent line at that specific point, 1, 80. So some students might be like, well, I don't really understand why we're doing this. Well, if we turn, if we turn it, there's a lot of different reasons, but if we turn it into back into velocity speak, the slope of the tangent line is the instantaneous velocity. So what if I wanted to know the instantaneous velocity at various times over the trip of the rock, right? That's what we did. We threw the rock straight up. So this function over here is telling us what, this, what the instantaneous velocity is going to be generally at any point 
this right here tells us what the instantaneous velocity is going to be uh, after one second. So basically, it, it provides very valuable information, not only with velocity, but other things we're going to talk about later. So finding this is very important to what we're actually going to be doing. Okay, so let's get a little bit even more detailed. It says, if you look below at the graph of the function, negative 16 squared plus 96x. Okay, so what I did was um, I extended the graph of the original function we had where we were throwing the rock, I think before it only went to like here. So I extended it so you see the full upside down parabola facing, uh, facing down uh, for the entire graph. So we're going to use it in order to make some important realizations. Okay, so if you look at the graph, uh, you'll see that there is a tangent line drawn at various points of the curve. So this tangent line is drawn at x equals 1. This tangent line is drawn at x equals 2. This one at x equals 3, and so forth throughout the picture. So you can see that you can draw a different tangent line at every single point on the curve. We're just using integers because it makes life a little bit easier for what we're doing. Okay. So real quick, what did we do up here? We found the derivative of the function and we used it right here in order to find the slope of the tangent line at x equals 1. What did we get? We got 64. So let's go verify that. So at x equals 1, what is the slope of the tangent line? Well, according to this, it is indeed 64 feet per second. Okay, so, so far so good. Uh, it says, um, observe how the slope of the tangent line changes at, e at each time. For example, at 2 seconds, the slope of the tangent line is what? Okay, so at 2 seconds... The slope of this tangent line is 32 feet per second. It says, why is the res this result smaller than the velocity at one second? Well, we talked about that before. What is taking hold? Gravity. So gravity is slowing down the rock. Okay, let's talk about more. What about at three seconds? It, what's the slope of the tangent line at 3 seconds right here? It appears that the slope of the tangent line is 0 feet per second. So what's happening here, folks? Why is it at this, the velocity 0? Well, basically what has happened, the rock has reached its apex, its acme, a lot of different synonyms for that. Uh, basically, the rock has reached... highest point. So it stopped. All right? It's about an instantaneous scenario where the rock just stops in spot place for that one instantaneous moment. What's last? How about four seconds? So we go over here to four seconds and we see a definite change in the value of the slope of the tangent. It is now negative 32. Well, that makes sense. This, we're now a falling line, so slopes of falling lines from left to right are negative. But what, what would that mean in the scope of our problem? Well, clearly now, what's the rock? Once it stops, now it's falling to the ground. So rock is falling. But I'm going to use a very specific terminology in the opposite direction. Okay, so why am I saying that? Because when a velocity is negative, it means that the object is moving in the opposite direction. So in the beginning of the problem, positive represented up. So any positive feet per second slope of the tangent line represents the direction straight up, which means if we go into a negative slope, that represents the opposite direction, which is straight down. Okay, so last thing. It says, overall, this gives you a better look at how the derivative is the slope of the tangent at any point of the curve. Why do we know that? Because if I want to find f prime of 1, I plug 1 in here. Into the function, I get 64. 
If I want f prime of 2, I plug 32 into the function up here. If I want to find f prime of 3, I pl put 3 in. So this equation for the derivative is finding us all of these slopes individually by plugging in the respective numbers. Okay, we do have one small part of the process to do. So let me just get rid of the noise here, all the markings that we had. So it says, returning to the exercise with the rock, let's wrap it up by finding the actual equation of the tangent line to the graph at 180. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? Well, we found the derivative, which provides us the slope of the tangent line at any point. We found the actual slope at 180 right here. So remember in old school algebra, the slope is m, right? And we've seen it in the with msec in the previous problem, but the slope is m. Now, what does it want? It wants you to take the point and the slope you calculated, which was, again, uh, 32, 64. So it was 64, right? I want you to take the slope and the point and find the equation of this line, tangent line running through this point. Okay, so if you recall, the point slope formula in algebra was y minus 1, 1 equals m times x minus x1. So what was the relevance of that? Uh, the y1 and the x1 are this coordinate right here. This is x1 comma y1. And the m is right here, which means all we have to do is plug those numbers into this equation, and we will get the equation of that tangent line. Now, just a small note, I did sort of a summary of that somewhere. I might have, actually, I might have done it below. Oh, the summary is, oh, the summary is down here. So... It says, norm, note that formally the equation of the tangent line at x equals a is the unique line through a f of a with the slope m tan and the equation y minus f of a equals m tan times x minus a. So a lot of students, their heads are probably going to explode with all these variables, but in reality, it's very straightforward what we're doing uh, in terms of just taking this equation right here again. We're doing y minus y1. Well, y1 is 80. But what else is 80? Well, this was also a f of a. We talked about that before. So basically, we're putting f of a in there. Then equals the slope. Well, the slope is 64. And that is m tan, the slope of the tangent, times x minus x1. Well, x1 is obviously this. But it's also a in our original problem. So a was, in this scenario, 1. So this clearly gives us an equation. I do not need you to simplify this. I, this is fine for providing the, slope, the equation of the tangent line. But uh, if you were to actually simplify this, you would get y minus 80 equals 64x minus 64. And then you would get uh, y is equal to 64x. It looks like plus 16. So this is your y equals mx plus b that you're used to. Uh, I don't need you to go ahead and do that, uh, but this represents essentially the equation of the tangent line right here in our picture. Okay, so every single problem, not every single, but most problems that we do, this is a primary thing in all this in all of calculus that you don't want to get confused by. It's a three-step process. You find the derivative of the function because that gives you the slope of, at the, of the tangent at any point. Then you find the slope at a specific point. Then you find beyond that the equation of the tangent line at that point. So there are three different steps to this and this is something you want to be able to get used to because you'll be doing it a lot. Okay, so the next order of business is to basically run through this example uh, but all in one problem, okay? So uh, that'll be the scope, and the problems themselves are going to be much more challenging. I do not want to run through another example of a simple, like, linear setup here where the equations are super easy. Uh, I want to go through a more uh, difficult scenario because that's what you really want examples for. 
The key is, though, what is the direct? The directions are, number one, it says find the equation of the tangent line, tangent to the graph at a equals 5. Okay, so to be clear, that is this in our previous problem. Okay, but in order to get this, what did we need to find first? The slope. And then before we could find the slope, what did we need to use, find to get that slope? The derivative. So we need to go through that three-step process in order to do this entire problem in number one. So let's start. So remember, f prime of x, the derivative, the first step that we always have to find is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Okay, this derivative is what's going to allow us to find the slope at a specific point and then the equation at that point. That is going to be our goal and what we do. Okay, so what does that look like? Well, let's write it all out. So we're going to get the slope is h, or the limit is h goes to 0. Uh, f of x is obviously this. So to find f of x plus h, we have to put x plus h right there. So what does that look like? That's going to be 3 over x plus h minus 2 minus the original function 3 over x minus 2 all over h. So if that's a struggle for you, you, you will need to do a lot of practice because you need to look at it and see that all we're doing is subbing in x plus h in for x. Okay, so what are we looking at? Well, a lot of students will look at this and go, oh my goodness, like what is happening right now? How do I even handle this? Well, I've, I've already given you examples like this before, believe it or not. This is a complex fraction. Okay, complex fraction. So with a complex fraction, we had a very specific strategy for solving it. We always found the LCD of all the fractions, and we multiplied top and bottom by it. So if you look at this problem, you know I'm going to erase it. Technically, these are the three fractions here, 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 and here. We don't have to worry about the 1 in the denominator, but the fractions in the numerator are x plus h minus 2 and x minus 2. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? Uh, that means that in order to get the common denominator of these, they even though students will look at this and think they have something in common because there's an x and a 2, they don't. They have nothing in common. So that means the least common denominator is going to be the product of the two. So x plus h minus 2 times x minus 2. So that means we need to multiply. Let me put it in green. We need to multiply both sides by x plus h minus 2 times x minus 2. Or top, not both sides, but top and bottom by x plus h minus 2 uh, times x minus 2. Okay, so to do that, let's see what that looks like. So the limit of h goes to 0. Bring that down. If we multiply the first quantity here by this right here, what cancels out? The x plus h minus 2. So what are you left with? Only 3, the numerator, times x minus 2. Note the denominator is gone. So this denominator right here is gone. It canceled out with this right here. So uh, what about the second quantity? We have a 3. If we multiply x minus 2 times this quantity, what cancels out? The x minus 2. So we end up with 3 times x plus h minus 2. So the entire numerator has been distributed. So this whole thing is distributed to both of these things. When we multiply 3 we, through, we officially um, re clear the denominators of those fractions. In the denominator itself, which is down here, there is nothing to cancel out, so we have to actually uh, multiply the entire thing out like this, or show that it's multiplied out. But, again, what I don't want you to do, I do not want you to actually foil or do any type of uh, distributive property at the bottom. Leave it as it is. Alright, so let's keep on moving. The numerator is distributed 3x minus 6 minus 3x minus 3h plus 6, all over repeating the same quantity, h, x plus h minus 2, x minus 2. 
Okay, so just a reminder back in our original problem. So clearly, if we plug zero in there in the beginning, this whole thing would have blew up. Division by zero. So what's the issue? H. So what does that mean is going to happen eventually? The H is going to end up canceling out here with the numerator, which is why we don't want to multiply anything out. So let's keep on going and see if that actually happens. The limit of h goes to 0. Uh, you'll see that the 3x is gone, the 6 is gone, and we end up once again with only the quantity that has h in it in the numerator. Okay, And hopefully right now you see that we are in a perfect position to eliminate the h's. So let's go over here. So equals, keep, keep on keeping on, h, is, h goes to 0, we get negative 3 over x plus h minus 2 times x minus 2. And finally, we've reached the point where we can actually evaluate the limit. If we put a 0 in for that quantity, we drop the limit and we get the equation negative 3 over x minus 0 minus 2 times x minus 2 which more formally is negative 3 over x minus 2 squared. So this is the derivative of the function 3 over x minus 2. Okay, so essentially that is step number 1. <laughs> I know, students are like, huh, step number 1? Uh, but uh, no, we, we've only found the slope of the tangent at any point. We have, no, we have no relevance to this a equals 5 going on here yet. So before we go anywhere, let's talk about that. What is a equals 5? Well, basically, a equals 5 is the x value of the coordinate. So x is 5. So before we go anywhere with this problem from here, what do we need to know? We need to know what y is, right? So what did we do in this problem back here? They said, what is the slope of the tangent at the point 180? So they actually gave you x and y. So the equivalent to our problem to this would be at a equals 1. Like if we were to do that, the same type of problem. So we need to find what y is. So this is a little bit tricky. So just note, if we need to find y for this problem... Uh, we need to plug in 5 into the original function, not the derivative. So we need to find f of 5, which is equal to 3 over 5 minus 2, which is equal to 1. So that means the coordinate that they're referring to is the coordinate 5, 1. Okay, so they didn't give you as much information to start, so you have to do a mini calculation to get this coordinate. So we now know that this, the tangent line itself runs through the point 5, 1. But what do we need to know in order to find the equation? We need the point, one point, and the slope. We don't have the slope yet. We have the slope of any point. We don't have the slope of that point. So how do we do it? We need to find f prime of 5. So 5 is here. We need to find f prime of 5. How do we do that? We get negative 3, which is our slope equation over here, over 5 minus 2 quantity squared, which is going to give us negative 3 over, it looks like 9, which is negative 1 third. So the slope of the tangent line at 5 is negative 1 third. So to be clear, this is the slope of tangent at any point. This is slope of tangent at x equals 5 or a equals 5, however you want to write it. So that means there's only one step left to actually get what the problem is asking for the equation of the tangent line. So how do we do that? Remember, we're doing y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. Uh, we are now have the coordinate and we have the slope. 
so we can plug those in. So what's our y? It's 1. What's our slope? It's negative 1 third. third. And what's our x coordinate? It is 5. So the equation of the tangent line is, let me erase this because it's ugly looking. <laughs> y minus 1 is equal to negative 1 third times x minus 5. So uh, to be clear, what does that mean? If I were to draw this graph, 3 times x minus 2, somewhere on a coordinate plane, and I went to that graph and found the coordinate 5, 1, if I drew a tangent through the graph that one, at that 1.51, its slope would be negative one-third, and its the equation of that line would be y minus one equals negative one-third times x minus five. Okay, so why don't we do one more, good practice, uh, before we get anywhere. And my, I'm gonna do, use a little different strategy here. We are being asked for the same thing, so we have to go through the whole process here, but why don't we tackle this sucker at the beginning? So it says that a equals five again, which we know means x equals five. So before we even get started with anything with derivatives, why don't we just find the coordinate uh, right at the start of the problem? So we know x is 5. So what do we need to do? We need to find f of 5. So we do the square root of 2 times 5 minus 1, because this is our function. We get the square root of 9, which is 3. Okay, so therefore, we know that the coordinate we're dealing with that this tangent line is going through is 5 comma 3. So before we even get started, we know that for our equation, we already have our point. So the whole goal of all of the work we're going to do is to find the slope. Okay, so let's do that. So f prime of x. So again, what are we trying to do? We're drawing the limit of h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over all right, so now we have to do it for this function right here. So always bring the limit with you. If you don't, you'll run into issues, I can promise you. Uh, so let's put x plus h in for x here. So x plus h in for x for our first radical, then minus our original function, 2x minus 1, with the root all over h. Okay, so what do we got going on here? Another mess, but... I, as I've claimed in the previous problem, you have seen this before. Specifically, you have radicals. And yes, if we plug in zero here, this thing is going to blow up. But what about rearranging the chairs on the deck? How can we rearrange this in order to possibly get a limit we can use? Well, if you recall, when we use radicals, we talked about what was called rationalizing the numerator. And how do you rationalize a numerator? You multiply by the conjugate of the numer numerator over its, the same value in order to do so. So let's do that. What's the conjugate? We have to change the sign. So we multiply by 2 times x plus h uh, minus 1 plus square root of 2x minus 1 over the same exact quantity. We must use the same quantity because this value, whole value must be 1, just like this whole value had to be 1 in the previous problem. Okay, so if we do that, then uh, we can go ahead and do the algebra. Now, this is going to be a little bit trickier. Uh, actually, I don't need to write this. Uh, we got the limit as h goes to 0. So what does this look like? Well, the denominator is a debacle. Uh, there's nothing really that cancels or does anything. So what do we have to do? We just have to multiply h by exactly what we see. Uh, um, x plus h minus 1 plus... Uh, let me just start over. It's a little bit of a mess. So we're going to do h times the square root uh, 2 times x plus h minus 1 plus the square root of 2x minus 1. All right. The numerator is interesting. So if you recall, the purpose of multiplying something by a conjugate is to eliminate the inside terms. So if you have something like uh, 2 plus root 3, 
and you multiply by 2 minus root 3. If you FOIL, you get 4. Outside is minus 2 root 3. Uh, inside is positive 2 root 3. Last is minus 3. So what always happens? These terms cancel, and we only care about the product of 2 and 2 and root 3 and negative root 3. So instead of doing a lot of work that's unnecessary, we're going to do the same thing for multiplying these two quantities right here. So we only care about the product of the first two and the last two. Well, if we multiply this by this, it's the same number multiplied the radical. So if we multiply root 3 times root 3, what happens to the radical? It disappears. So that's what's going to happen here. We're going to get 2 times x plus h minus 1 as our first quantity. Radicals disappeared minus our second quantity, which is going to be, oh, by the way, I think I erased the root here, uh, is going to be just 2x minus 1. So you're doing this times this, and then you're doing this times this, and you're getting what's on the paper there. All right, so this is a, obviously a very, <laughs> a lot going on here. So let's just uh, do the distributive property in the top. So we got 2x plus 2h. Um, minus 1, you have to distribute this to get minus 2x plus 1. And then you have to rewrite the crazy denominator, 2 times x plus h. I know some people will want to distribute there, uh, but and you can actually with here, but uh, you don't need to. All right, so what happens in the numerator? So again, before, this blows up the problem, so h has to go away. So what does beautifully happen, just like before, all the non-h terms are gone. We get the limit of h goes to 0 of just 2h over h times, again, this craziness, 2 times x plus h minus 1. I know, a lot of writing. Minus 1, just like that. And luckily, our h's cancel, and then we can sort of go to our almost finish line here. So this is equal to the limit of h goes to 0 of 2 over uh, the square root of 2 times x plus h minus 1 plus the square root of 2x minus 1. All right, so get rid of all this, so we get a subtraction. So right now, we've officially reached the point where our h is gone, which means we can actually use this limit and evaluate, which goes right there. If we put it there, this whole quantity here becomes just x. So what does that look like? That'll be limit drops. We get 2 over the square root of 2x minus 1 plus the square root of 2x minus 1. So that is equal to, well, if we have... If you normally have a root 5 and you add another root 5, you get a 2 root 5. So now we have a root 2x minus 1 and another root 2x minus 1. So now we have a 2 root 2x minus 1. And again, look what cancels, the 2s. And we're left with the final derivative, which is 1 over the square root of 2x minus 1. Okay, This is the derivative of the function. And again, this is the slope of the tangent line at any point but we want it so this would be the first step okay but we want the slope of the tangent at specifically the point a equals 5 or in other words x equals 5 so what do we do we just do f prime of 5 so we go all right well that's 1 over the square root of 2 times 5 minus 1 well 2 times 5 is 10 minus 1 is 3 is 9 1 over root 9 is 1 third so no coincidence that we have another one-third. I know that was negative, but that is the slope of the tangent at x equals 5. So finally, if we want to find the equation of the tangent line, we have everything we need. Why? Because we have the point and the slope. So we can use point-slope equation to do y minus 3 is equal to one-third times x minus 5, and that is the solution to the problem. Okay, I just want to add one more thing to the scenario here, not with learning calculus, but just with understanding that this is not always going to be this crazy. Okay, so and what do I mean by that? 
So step two and three are never going to change. But if you look at step two and three, they're pretty easy. Step one is going to change. So look at all, I mean, the work that we have to do in order to find this insanity, my goodness. We have to do all of this crazy work in order to find the derivative. Believe it or not, in the next couple sections, specifically two sections from now, you're going to be learning about essentially the shortcuts for finding derivatives. So you'll be able to find derivatives in less than 15 seconds, sometimes in three seconds. So this entire procedure that I was talking about here, that it just is not fun, basically goes from having to sit there for five minutes to find a derivative to going to 15 seconds. So this entire process will be a very quick process when all said and done. So I just so you don't worry about the fact that you think you're going to be doing this every single time because derivatives are a big part of the class. So realize that will change in due time and most of you will appreciate those formulas when we get to them.